Hello friends, uh, so we have started with the constitutive analysis, uh, uh, analysis of uh, high temperature deformation. In that uh, today uh, I will st first start with the low strain rate uh, or the constitutive an, uh, equations which were developed for low strain rate or as we have just uh, seen in the previous lecture where the creep kind of deformation takes place. Okay. Why I am taking this one is because this uh, for high temperature deformation the development of constitutive equation actually started with the creep uh, kind of deformation first. Okay. The reason for that is that for the high temperature or the hot working uh, which we uh, do in, in, in the industry, okay. initially the equipments were not there to do that kind of testing in the, uh, in the machine, the servo hydraulic machines or the other machines were not able to, capable to give that kind of strain rate to the uh, sample. Okay. So, only the data which was being collected is from the actual industrial processes where you cannot get the stress as a function of a strain rate and temperature and so on. So, best you can could do at that time with high uh, with uh, industrial process hot working is uh, that you deform the material at different temperature for example, applying different strain rate and look at the microstructure. Okay, but you could not develop the constitutive analysis for hot deformation and th that is strain rate range okay, which is from 10 to the power minus 1 to 10 to the power 2. Okay. But the creep kind of deformation was much easier because it is under constant load or constant stress condition. Okay. So, you keep a sample in the furnace okay, and you apply some certain amount of load or stress on that and as a function of time you can uh, look at the that how the deformation is progressing or how strain is accumulating in the material. Okay. So, initial work on the constitutive analysis especially for hot deformation or high temperature condition okay, was taking was taken was took place in the creep kind of deformation. Okay. That is why I am taking that one as the first one to understand the constitutive equation in the creep kind of condition and then we will come to the uh, hot working conditions or high strain rate conditions. Okay. So, these are uh, as I have told that uh, category of constitutive equation. So, I am taking the phenomenological based constitutive equations here right now first. Okay. So, all this creep kind of uh, uh, deformation was uh, was done using this phenomenological approach. Okay. Deformation mechanism already we have these are the typical deformation mechanism which takes place during the high temperature deformation. Okay. So, you have usually what we get at room temperature or low temperature uh, is through dislocation glide okay, that the dislocation generation will takes place then the dislocation will glide on the slip plane in the slip direction. Okay. So, this is your usual dislocation glide mechanism, Th this is one of the mechanism uh, always will be there. Then there can be dislocation creep, okay. in this now the dislocation movement is also aided by the thermal activation. Okay. So, in this what happens is that your additional slip systems uh, become sometime active. Okay. And if there are any barriers to dislocation movement that can be overcome with the thermal activation, okay. for example, for dislocation climb process. Okay. So, there are different uh, type of uh, thermally activated process which can help the dislocation to move. So, dislocation glide is also helped through the thermal activation. Then there can be uh, because you are at higher temperature. Okay, diffusion based uh, deformation also can take place, this is what we call as diffusion creep. So, flow of vacancies takes place under the applied stress. Okay. So, this is another very important mechanism at high temperature. Another very important mechanism uh, you will see is called grain boundary sliding, okay, where the grain actually see dislocation what happens is the deformation is taking place within the grain. Okay. So, if, if you are deforming a grain by dislocation mechanism it will or diffusion mechanism also it will get elongated okay, in the direction of the principal strain. Whereas, in grain boundary sliding 
okay the grain body you or grain you can consider as a rigid body okay uh, so there are two rigid bodies okay and the grains are sliding past each other okay so there is a sliding between the grain so deformation is not within the grain deformation is at the grain boundary okay and grains are sliding past each other a very interesting mechanism okay at high temperature because your grain boundary diffusion will be very high okay grain boundaries are weaker compared to grain uh, uh, interiors okay so you can have this kind of grain boundary sliding in superplasticity it is one of the prominent mechanism of deformation so you can see this in superplasticity diffusion creep usually uh, at lower stresses okay you will see diffusion creep okay whereas dislocation creep you will see at higher stresses okay so here also there is kind of a demarcation okay where you will see dislocation creep and where you will see the diffusion creep so diffusion creep means it is a, it happens at very low stresses so only the diffusion will or, or the creep will be through diffusion mechanism okay there is no dislocation uh, movement at those low stresses okay so uh, if you want to see a constitutive equation for creep this is a power law kind of relationship okay a power law relation so epsilon dot okay so now you can see that when we talk about creep we don't relate stress with strain rate temperature and so on we relate strain rate with the stress okay because in this the our control variable is the stress the the load which we are applying the constant load or constant stress which we are applying on the material and looking at the strain as a function of time okay so when we are looking at the strain as a function of time of course we are looking at the strain rate okay so under a applied load uh, constant load what is the strain rate of deformation okay so we are looking at the strain rate that is my dependent variable and this sigma is my independent variable which is i am applying and these are called power law, law relationship because you have a, a, a exponential power here over whatever is your input variable sigma in this case okay so you can see th that there are some material constants here for example a and n are material constants okay d is your diffusion coefficient okay which is basically d naught exponential minus q by kt q is your activation energy for diffusion okay g is your shear modulus okay b is of course your burgers vector okay k is your boltzmann constant i am not able to write here in the this space okay and t is of course temperature in kelvin okay and the stress is actually as you can see is normalized with shear modulus here okay so whenever you see constitutive equation this you will see a lot that we are trying to normalize the parameter with some uh, material constant here in this case we are normalizing it with the shear modulus okay so this is what we call as a power law relationship okay where strain rate is dependent on distress with power n okay now how people have got this particular equation so this is where phenomenological i was telling you comes in picture okay so this is your equation how i have got this particular equation okay so the idea is that you plot parameter so if you see on the y axis the parameters are like this it is not visible clearly so i am just plotting it here okay so basically what we are doing kt is taken here okay and this particular parameter is taken in the denominator so that is how you have got this y okay so now when you have done that okay what remains is sigma by g okay so sigma by g is taken on the x axis so you are normalizing the stress with shear modulus and that you are plotting on x axis okay of course it is also on in in logarithmic scale you can see because you have to take log on both side to make it linear okay again the same ideas we are using 
So, log if you take on both the side the n will come uh, as a slope. Okay. So, instead of taking log actually if you see they have plotted on a log scale. Okay. You can see 10 to the power minus 5, 10 to the power minus 4, 10 to the power minus 3. Okay. This is my log scale. Similarly, this is my log scale 10 to the power minus 14, minus 13, minus 12 and so on. So, instead of taking log here they have made the scale as logarithmic okay that is why you do not see log on the parameter here and how they have found out this particular equation that should be interesting to see you are trying to find out that what parameter again from the phenomena what parameters I have to normalize the strain rate how what parameter to use the normalize the stress. Okay, so, that I can get a linear relationship and then it is very easy for me to uh, fit a straight line and get the equation. Okay, so, that is what is the uh, regression and empirical analysis okay, using phenomena that how I can or what type of parameters will be required okay, to make it a linear relationship. Okay, so, you can see that how they are dividing by different parameters here, different parameters here and to get a linear relationship. And by normalizing another important thing which can take place is that data from different material can be put on a single graph. Okay. So, to, to kind of uh, uh, demonstrate that this is a universal phenomena, it is a general equation. Okay. It is not an equation for a particular type of material, it can be applied to any material. Only difference will be that as material changes your n, this material constant will change. Okay. Rest everything will remain same. So, it basically it will be linear mostly. Okay. And you can see here the lot of different data is plotted. So, you have silver, silver, nickel, lead, I think aluminum, aluminum. Okay. And then uh, of course, aluminum here, nickel here, aluminum here, copper here. Okay. So, lot of data is plotted on the uh, single band of curve okay. and through that uh, by the slope I will be able to get the parameter n okay. and uh, from the I think the intercept I will be able to get the parameter a. Okay. So, this is how I would be able to get the constitutive equation for a creep kind of deformation. Though it looks scary as I have told you, but it is not that scary. Okay. Only thing is uh, we have to find out this parameter to fit a nice straight line. Now, what are the constitutive equation for diffusion creep? So, that, that was for dislocation creep. Okay. There will be now some new parameter will be introduced. Okay. So, first one in this is called neighbor of hearing creep which is creep by lattice diffusion. So, I will just give you a quick understanding of this. Okay. Suppose, this is my grain, okay. these are the grain boundaries. Okay. So, when you have neighbor a hearing creep, diffusion creep is at low stresses as I told you, the dislocation will not be a mechanism here. Okay. So, the creep will take place through diffusion mechanism. So, suppose I am applying a stress in this direction, this is a tensile stress. Okay. So, what will happen is when I am applying tensile stress, okay, the you kind of you are creating more gap in this direction by stretching it. Okay. So, when you are creating more gap, you are creating a, a, a driving force for atoms to diffuse from this direction toward this direction. So, as you can understand that if I am applying the tensile stress in this direction, there will be induced compressive stresses from the perpendicular direction. Okay. So, basically you are pushing the atoms to diffuse from this from so the atoms are diffusing from this uh, direction towards this direction. Okay. Similarly, it will be going like this in this direction okay. and for atoms to diffuse here okay, there will be a reverse diffusion of vacancies of course. Okay. Vacancies have to go, so this dashed one is vacancies. 
So, vacancies are moving uh, from there uh, from tensile side to the compressive side and atoms are moving from compressive side to tensile side ok and slowly you will see that the grain is el getting elongated because of that because you are removing material from this side and adding on this side ok. So, there will be continuous uh, elongation of the grain because of this deformation ok. So, now you can see some uh, new parameter which is coming here which is you can see here d ok where d is your grain size grain diameter ok and dv is of course your lattice diffusion coefficient. So, it uh, because the diffusion is through lattice so of course, it will be dependent on the lattice diffusion, but there is also an effect of the grain size here which was not there in the previous equation. Okay, so, now you can see again that how we are trying to linearize the equation to get this empirical relationship okay, because now we see that there is there, there will be an effect of grain size here. Okay, so, grain diameter is coming in the picture. The another type of same in similar fashion through diffusion process is what we call as cobalt creep. Okay. In this the creep takes place by grain boundary diffusion. So, in the earlier case it was through lattice ok and now if I see in this case now the diffusion is taking place through the grain boundaries ok. This grain boundary diffusion is going to take place ok. So, the another type of creep which takes place in the through diffusion process is called cobalt creep ok. In this the creep takes place by grain boundary diffusion ok and you can see that if I plot a grain like this the diffusion will be taking place through the grain boundary here ok and because of that there will be a effect on the grain size. So, in never a hearing creep the grain size had a exponent of 2 whereas, in this the grain size has an exponent of 3. So, the cobalt creep is more influenced by the grain size ok, whereas, the NH creep is there is a less dependence on the grain size ok. So, as exponent is increasing you can understand that it will have more effect on the strain rate. So, at lower in, in fact, if you want to compare in the same material where the NH creep takes place and where the cobalt creep takes place ok, you should do an experiment where you are refining the grain size ok. So, you will see that for a smaller grain size cobalt creep is the important uh, diffusion process because you have more grain boundary to for diffusion to take place. Whereas, for the coarse grain uh, for the same material NH creep will be the dominant def uh, deformation creep uh, dominant creep process where the diffusion will take place through the lattice ok. So, there you can see very subtle changes which are taking place in the in the constitutive equation based on the what type of deformation uh, mechanism which is operating in the material. Okay, so, in fact, I can kind of uh, summarize this in, 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 a one, in a nutshell here. Okay. So, instead of plotting uh, giving you different uh, creep equation, I, I am giving you a generalized creep equation for example, here okay, where epsilon dot is related to diffusion coefficient, shear modulus, Berger's vector, temperature, stress is normalized with, with shear modulus with an exponent n grain size is uh, normalized with the Berger's vector with an exponent p. So, p is your grain size exponent here and n is your stress exponent. Of course, d is d not exponential minus q by r t ok. So, you can see for NH creep the a will be the it, it is favored by high temperature low stress and large grain size as I, I was telling you. So, at very low stresses and large grain size you will have NH creep vacancy diffusion through crystal lattice. A will be in the range of 10 to 15, the exponent is n uh, 1 ok that means, it has al already a linear relationship there and grain size exponent is 2 as we have just seen. For cobalt creep again it is at low stress, but in fine grain size ok. 
temperature less than those for which NH creep dominates. Okay, so it it happens at lower temperature. Why it happens at lower temperature? Because grain boundary diffusion will be faster. Okay, because grain boundaries are already having uh, uh, open structure, so my diffusion of atoms through grain boundary can take place at lower temperature also. Whereas uh, uh, diffusion through lattice require vacancies okay and vacancies you can have a higher concentration only at high temperature okay so cobalt creep can dominate for fine grain size as well as for lower temperature okay vacancy diffusion through grain boundary a is in this 30 to 50 range of course stress exponent is again one here whereas the grain size exponent is 3 grain boundary sliding okay it can be in the same range as NH or cobalt creep, sliding accommodated by vacancy diffusion through crystal. Okay. So, again P is equal to 2 or 3 depends upon whether the diffusion is taking place through crystal lattice or along grain boundary, but N is in this case is 2 okay. and uh, P is 2 or 3 depending upon where the diffusion is taking place. Dislocation creep will be taking place higher stress at higher stresses. Okay, uh, where now dislocation can uh, start gliding okay, under the applied stress. Lower temperature in compares, comparison to cobalt creep and of course, at larger grain size. Dislocation motion with climb over microstructural uh, uh, obstacles. So, climb can take place through high temperature activation or thermal activation. N is in this range 3 to 8, okay, very large range okay depending on so in each of these range also there will be subtle changes in the deformation processes there is no grain size dependent okay so that is why you remember when i was this this uh, discussing dislocation creep there was no term for grain size there okay because it doesn't have any dependence on the grain size on stress it has a very strong dependence uh, and at the same time it has a big range okay so depending upon what type of deformation mechanism is taking place uh, your n will change okay more on n and q okay just to uh, clarify this more okay because this will you will keep calculating during whenever you are developing constitutive equation okay so a stress expo ex exponent of around 5 okay this is usually you will see in pure metal creep okay in which dislocation structure plays dominant role with subgrains formed and dislocation crime is rate, rate controlling okay so in dislocation creep okay which takes place at relatively higher stresses okay usual your uh, processes will take place which also takes place during hot deformation okay that dislocation will generate Okay, they will uh, kind of uh, realign, rearrange through climbing process into subgrains, forming low angle grain boundaries. Okay, and uh, because they are they are getting recovered through this rearrangement of dislocation climb through dislocation climb, the dislocation climb is the rate controlling process. Okay, so whenever we develop constitutive equation, we are also trying to understand which is the rate controlling process here that means which determines the kinetics of the process okay and if you see q here it will be very close to the self diffusion of that particular material whatever is the matrix material if it is aluminum alloy then q will be close to the activation energy for self diffusion of aluminum which is around 140 kilojoule per mole okay and what we require for self diffusion self diffusion means aluminum atom will self diffuse okay and what you need for self diffusion is vacancies okay so uh, and uh, uh, atomic migration so the the activation energy will be dependent on the creation of vacancies plus activation barrier for migration okay so when you calculate q from uh, as we have seen earlier that how i can calculate q from the data if it is coming close to the activation energy for self diffusion then we can say that it is a climb control process okay 
why we say are saying that because you need vacancies for climbing also okay so when vacancy is diffusing of course atoms are also diffusing in the opposite direction so these vacancies will be required for climbing process okay so vacancy diffusion will be related to the self diffusion of the material so if climb is controlling then q should be equal to the uh, the activation energy should be equal to the activation energy of self diffusion okay if n is equal to 3 in which case the solute effect dominates the creep resistance okay so you know that in when we are developing alloys there will be some solute atom inside the material okay and what this solute atom do is they go and collect in the core of the dislocation okay i don't know whether you know that if i let's say a simple example of edge dislocation which i can draw like this this is my extra half plane so because the, you have an extra half plane here you have compressive stresses here okay and tensile stresses below the slip plane so uh, if you have solute atom in the material what they try to do is at high temperature solute will also be able to diffuse okay so what they like to do is if the solute atom is of bigger size than the matrix okay then those solute atom will go and sit where the tensile stresses are there or tensile strain are there because the bonds are stretched there a uh, bigger atom can go and easily sit okay uh, applying the compressive stresses now and this tensile compressive will balance out whereas if the solute atom is of a smaller size okay it will like to sit where the compressive stresses are there because already atoms are compressed okay a smaller atom will help them to reduce the strain energy so a smaller atom will go and sit in the upper side so a smaller solute atom will sit here a bigger solute atom will sit in the tensile side what it does when this solute go and sit in the dislocation core now dislocation if suppose you are applying stress it wants to move it has to carry all this solute atom also with with the dislocation okay sometime if you are applying higher stresses dislocation velocity is sufficiently high then sometime it can also leave this solute atom and uh, will be free to go okay uh, but sometime if the stresses are low it has to carry all this solute atom also with with it okay so the stresses to move a dislocation will be now different because you it has to carry this extra load okay so in those cases you have n equal to around 3 when the solute effect dominate the creep resistance okay a viscous glide process and a uniform distribution of dislocation result q scales with the activation energy of solute diffusion okay because how fast solute will be able to diffuse that decide how the dislocation is going to move and that decides the creep rate okay if n equal to is 5 which shows an intermediate behavior in that creep is considered to be controlled by recovery but the dislocation moves in a viscous manner okay so for different n different q i can kind of uh, take a guess that what will be the dominant deformation uh, mechanism which is taking place in the material okay so with this uh, means we have covered uh, of course it is not related to the hot deformation which is, which is our primary concern here but uh, the constitutive equation development actually started for uh, high temperature deformation started with the creep uh, when people were developing it for creep and in, in the creep i think they were developing from 1950s and 60s if i am not wrong whereas for high temperature or hot working or it started after 80s or so okay because only then you started having that kind of equipment to apply a very high strain rate at high temperatures okay whereas in creep the this kind of work was going on for a long time so the initial uh, phase of development of constitutive equation during high temperature deformation was taking place in creep okay so by taking that we are able to kind of understand that how uh, to develop a, a constitutive equation okay so now we will go for the Uh, constitutive equation of uh, at a higher strain rate okay thank you